Hi, this is Dan from Akatika. We haven't been talking to you guys for a while, but we've got some new things to talk about, so let's get started. Today we're going to talk about assembling the GT104 amp modules. But before we do that, let's give you a little background. You may be very familiar with the GT102 and then the Z4 version thereof. They were based around the LM3886 power op amps from Texas Instruments. Now, as many of you may have seen, those particular parts are completely made of solid unobtainium at this point. You just can't get them. And TI really has no decent take-to-the-bank kind of numbers for when they're going to be available again. Best guess is in maybe a year or so we'll be able to get 3886s. So in the meantime, what's a good thing to do? Well, we kind of saw that this was coming quite a while ago and started working very hard and very fast on a discrete replacement for the LM3886. And that's what the GT104 is. So when you change a design like that and go from kind of an integrated circuit approach to a discrete component approach, there is good news and there's bad news. Let's get the bad news out of the way first. One thing for sure is that because so much of the stuff that used to be hidden inside the integrated circuit now must be external in discrete components, there's a lot more discrete components. The circuit board has about doubled in area. So that says you're going to have to put about twice the number of parts in. And that's basically the difference between integrated and separate discrete things. But the really nice thing about going discrete is we get to control everything we get to make it exactly like we like. And one of the most significant things we got to do is by changing the output transistors to a pair of discrete heavy duty MOSFET transistors and also nice fast MOSFETs, we can now in a GT104, we can drive four ohm speakers and drive them happily. Matter of fact, the GT104 in round numbers will put out about 50 watts into eight ohms and more significantly, it does about 100 watts into 4 ohms. That's a pretty nice change. So whether you want to have a GT104 or whether you'd like to try and procure one of the very last couple of Z4 GT102s in stock, we'll leave that up to you and to how the availability goes. But now it's time to take a look at building the GT104 amplifier modules. So the GT104 amplifier modules are actually kind of closely related to what was in the GT102. And as all of this evolved, we still had the hope that by the time we were ready to ship the next build, 3886s would be available. They aren't. But what we have is, here's the basic parts envelope for the 3886. Now, in addition, there's what we call the Delta kit. And this is the additional parts that we need on top. And this essentially replaces a lot of the function that used to sit inside the LM3886. So these two modules together give you all the parts, plus some spares that you'll see are left over at the end. And uh, this is what you need to build the GT104 amplifier module. So in the normal way, we're just going to take our lovely white bowl and dump all the parts in. And there's probably enough parts you might even want two lovely white bowls. I don't know. And all you have to do now is fit all these parts with a few exceptions onto this board and do everything absolutely perfectly or else it's not going to work. Okay, let me be serious for a moment. This kit is not for first time builders. All right. You probably could do it. It's just everything really has to be right. If you're willing to work slowly and calmly and methodically and to walk away when you're starting to get cross-eyed or confused, it'll come up the first time. Of course, by now you will have printed out the manual and then we will get to the first page where it talks about installing all of the quarter watt resistors. 
And in general, what we're going to do is we're going to start with the smallest components that sit closest to the board and work our way up to the larger and larger components as we get through the assembly process. So the idea is we're going to pick one of these quarter watt resistors at random. So I've picked out a group of four resistors that happen to be taped together. And now I'm just going to take a look at them. Now I could read the color code, but I would really recommend a quicker and easier way is just get your own meter out and then measure the resistors with your own meter. The colors sometimes look very similar one to the other and you can kind of get fooled. So that resistor is 99.4 kilo ohms. And just guessing about these things, that says it's probably a 100 kilo ohm resistor that we're looking at. And if you'd like to, you can always do a confirmation. If your eyes are old like mine, you may need some kind of a magnifying glass. And I'm looking at that, and yes, it's 100K, because I can tell it's brown, black, black, orange. And then what we're going to do is we'll just find the locations for the 400K resistors. One thing that's kind of nice is we put all the resistors in value order from the lowest to the highest, so it's easy to find what you need. And it does show us here that we've got R4, R6, R47, and R59. So then the next eye chart activity we get to do is we get to look at the board and find those four resistor positions. We'll take the leads of the resistors, cut off the tape, and then we'll bend the resistor leads in a lead bender. And it turns out that the correct spacing on this board for the small resistors is four tenths of an inch. And we just bend the resistor leads like that forms it and it makes it so they will drop into the board very elegantly and the finished product will look great. All four resistors bent. And now we have to do a search and we're going to look for R4, R6, R47, and R59. And you'll notice I've put on my magnifying because I've got old eyes. Let's find R4 and R6. That seems like a good place to start. It took a minute to find the locations for those four resistors, but they're now installed. And on the back of the board, you'll notice I've taken the leads and bent them slightly to keep the leads in place. And now that everything is in place, let's solder those four resistors. It's always a good idea to make sure your tip is clean. Now the tip right now does not look good. So we've got the Hacko wire cleaner. Let's see if that'll improve things. Ah, nice and shiny. We could even tin the tip too. Well, let's not do it over the board so we don't splash solder on the board. All right. And then one more pass through the tip cleaner. You notice now we've got a nice shiny end of the tip. If the soldering iron is working correctly, it should only take about two seconds to solder each joint. And the idea is that you put the solder between the lead and the heat. And that's really the best place to do it. And in about a second, everything soaks in. I didn't like the way that one went. It didn't solder well. Let's clean up the tip. And we'll get rid of that little bit of solder at the end. Now, quite frankly, part of the problem was I was trying to save some time, which I shouldn't have. And some of the leads were getting in the way of soldering some of the other leads. So you might want to preferentially have clipped the leads after you soldered each resistor. And the idea too is that we want to clip the leads 
close to, but kind of above the point, that is to say a little longer than the length of the solder joint. Because if you actually cut the solder joint itself, you will weaken the bond between the wire and the pads on the board. Four resistors down, probably another 40 resistors to go. I won't bore you with all of that. We'll just hit a couple of quick highlights next about some things to be careful about. If you want a little more information about soldering technique, there is a great YouTube and I'll link to it in the text boxes below. The other thing I'd like to do is to cover one or two components that people might tend to get in backwards despite what I've said in the manual. And one of those is the LEDs. The LEDs or light emitting diodes, like all diodes, have a polarity. And you want to make sure you get that polarity in correctly or things are not going to work. A couple of ways to know what the polarity of the LED is. One side of the LED is flat. It's got a round cross section except for one side. It's probably hard to see here in this video, but in real life it's a lot easier to see. That side is the cathode. In addition, if you look at the leads themselves, one lead is longer than the other. The positive lead, the anode, is the longer of the two leads. The cathode is the shorter of the two leads. That will unambiguously identify which is the proper orientation of the LED. Now, when you put it into the board, the rule we've got for this particular board is that the cathode should be under the number in LED1 or LED2. Normally we would not be inserting the LEDs this early, but we wanted to just show you about the correct orientation because getting it backwards is definitely not the thing to do. We're going to put it in this way. The longer lead is going to go under the L. The shorter lead will go under the number two. And we'll repeat that process when we put the other LED in LED1. The longer lead goes into the L, the shorter lead goes under the number. Here is a fully assembled amplifier module, and I'd like to point out a couple of things on it just so you'll have a better understanding of what the road ahead has. One thing that is brand new here is, well at least to this version, we have a bias pot. There's information in the manual that talks about how the bias pot gets adjusted. Here we've got a couple of heat sinks on driver transistors. Here are the output devices. These are power MOSFETs, both N-channel and P-channel. Right now I don't remember which one is which. Another really interesting thing we have in the amp is you'll notice there is a TO220 power transistor attached by the same mounting screw as one of the MOSFET power devices. And what that does is it gives us a very, very accurate reading of the temperature of the power stage. And we use that as part of a thermal feedback system that regulates the idling current of the amplifier. And it actually does this very well. You'll notice that the idling current of the amplifier barely changes from cold to stinking hot. The one other thing that I'd like to show you is that one of the transistors has an insulator before it mounts to the heat sink. Of course, in the manual, we talk about which one that is and how to do that mounting to the heat sink. And the final thing to note about this is that the heat sink itself will not be one of these. It's actually a heat sink that is about twice the width and even a bit taller. So we can accommodate the extra power dissipation of the GT104 amplifier module. The power supply for the GT104 is actually the same PC board and a lot of the same components as we used in the GT102. There are two small changes that we have made. One is that we allow it to deliver more output current to support 4 ohm loads. The other is we bump the output voltage up a little bit and that lets us get to the kind of powers in the even numbers of 50 and kind of almost 100 watts that we're looking for. So if you've built a GT102 or a Z4 in the past, this particular board will look quite familiar and comfortable to you. Just a few different values. By now, your only question probably is, 
how do I get a GT104? It'll be on the website shortly, but for a while it's going to be on limited availability. We do have a waiting list of everyone who's been waiting for a GT102 or a Z4. And quite frankly, this amp can replace either of those, and it's a bit of an upgrade too, I think. The only issue we're going to have is availability is still limited. We are still kind of in the throes of the post-COVID parts problems. Send me an email if you'd like to get one of these units. We'll put you on the waiting list, but hopefully we'll be shipping units or at least starting to ship these units in October of 2022. Thanks for your time. Catch you next time.